Hello, and welcome to the fourth English Today Business DVD. In this DVD, you can watch another four episodes of our story, On the Job, followed by the business skills section that looks at another aspect of win-win language. We'll then look at the following language topics. Describing the stages in a business transaction. Expressions used at international business fairs. The language and delivery techniques used in presentations. So, have fun and enjoy your viewing. Who's in charge of delivery to the Blue Moon Bookshop? Uh, Ann and I. Why? They've just telephoned, complaining that they haven't received anything yet. Well, that's impossible. I sent the delivery five days ago. That's just it. I don't understand what could have happened. The merchandise should have arrived by now. Anne, call the shipping agents to find out what's up. Hello, am I speaking to Fast Shipping? This is Anne Baxter from Pilgrim Publishing. I'd like to follow up on the merchandise we sent five days ago. Sorry? What? That's impossible. There must be some mistake. You can't have delivered it. Our client has just telephoned saying that they haven't received anything yet. OK. OK, I'll take a look at the paperwork and get back to you. Bye-bye. Yeah, well, Fast claims that the goods were signed for by the consignee. Rachel, go get the bill of lading. We need to look into what caused this mistake. Gary, are you sure you provided the exact address? Certainly. I still remember it. It's 35 Lafayette Avenue, Orange. That's it, all right. What about the duty? Do you remember paying it? Duty? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Stevens, but we're EU members and aren't required to pay duty. Merchandise is free to move between the member states, and duty is no longer required, nor is documentation. EU? What does Europe have to do with it? Uh, excuse me, but Orange is in France, isn't it? Good God, Gary. Blue Moon is in Orange, but not in France. Orange is a city in Massachusetts, USA. Oh. Call the bookshop immediately. What an idiot. That's why I paid less on freight charges than was budgeted. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hello, Pilgrim Publishing. This is Anne Baxter. How may I help you? Uh, hello, this is Victoria Lee. I'm calling in regards to the shipment. I was wondering if you had any news yet. Uh, yes, actually, I was just about to call you. Unfortunately, there's been a misunderstanding, uh, but don't worry. We're taking care of things on our end, and you should receive the goods very soon. Could you tell me exactly what's happened? My boss is extremely upset. The shipping documents were in order. According to the bill of lading, the supply should have already arrived. Can you explain why the merchandise is blocked in the custom warehouse? Uh, customs? Oh. No, you see, I'm afraid there's been a slight problem in addressing the goods and they've been sent to a destination in France instead of Massachusetts. France? Massachusetts? What are you talking about? The merchandise was destined for China. China? Oh, excuse me, um, are you the owner of the Blue Moon in Orange, Massachusetts? No, I'm not. I work for Spectre. We're a multinational sporting goods manufacturer. I'm speaking with fast shippers, aren't I? Well, actually, no. This is Pilgrim Publishing. I'm afraid you've got the wrong number. But we do have something in common. <laughs> we both use the same courier. <laughs> <laughs> Life is funny. I dial the wrong number, and who do I call? A publishing house. Maybe it's fate. Nice young woman as well. What was her name? Anne Baxter, that's right. 
We use the same couriers and are both having problems with deliveries. What a strange coincidence. Mrs. Lee, have you spoken with fast shippers yet? Uh, not yet. The number's always busy. We have to figure out what's happened. This delivery delay is costing us a lot of money. The courier assured us that the merchandise didn't have to pass through customs, that it would have left their warehouse with the customs bill already compiled without any additional customs requirements. That's right. Considering the shipping costs, they're so high because they include all international delivery costs, such as transit, loading and unloading, assembly and warehouse storage costs. Just a moment. I've got it. Did you remember to attach the certificate of origin, Mrs. Lee? The certificate of origin? I don't really know what that is. It's never been required for our shipments. The certificate of origin is that document which states the merchandise's country of origin for customs purposes. It's absolutely necessary for companies doing business in countries which don't belong to the EU provided upon customs officials' request. And China is one of those countries. I'm sorry, Mrs. Collins. I didn't know. I swear it. Up until now, I've never taken care of shipments. This is going to be one very expensive mistake. Oh, by the way, I'll be taking our losses caused by this delay out of your salary. Orange France, Orange Massachusetts. Well, that's an understandable mistake. But Orange China? You see what can happen if the goods are addressed to the wrong place. It can be very costly, as we saw in the video. Now, let's look at that process of buying and selling, that transactional process, and the commercial documents which are related to that. But first, do you know other terms for the word goods? Other ways of saying goods. There's products, merchandise, and also freight. Do you know that? Freight. F-R-E-I-G-H-T. Yeah, all four of them we use. Products, goods, merchandise, and freight. So let's look at that process now. And imagine that we are a buyer, a potential buyer. We would like to buy something. And so we contact a seller. Look at the screen, which will give you the list of the documents which we would need to do this transaction. The first one is the buyer makes an inquiry. Now, inquiry can be written with an E at the beginning or an I, an inquiry. So what's that? Well, that's an, to ask if goods are available, what the price of those goods are, what the conditions of delivery are, and also what the terms of payment are. So we as the buyer make an inquiry. Now, the potential seller sends back another document, which is called the offer or the quotation. In that document, the seller offers to sell us the required goods, the goods that we have ordered at their price and in their, with their conditions. After that, we as the buyer decide if we want to go ahead. And if we do, then we make the order. That's the third document, the order. Now, in the order, we have all the full particulars and details of the goods that are to be supplied by the seller. So we have the inquiry, then the quotation, and now the order. After the goods are then packaged and they are prepared for transportation, usually we contact a shipping agent. Now, a shipping agent are the people who actually organize the transportation of merchandise. And they're also called um, freight forwarders. You see that word again? Freight. Freight forwarders or shipping agents. Now that can be by sea, by land, or by air, depending on where the goods are going and what the goods are. Okay, 
So we decide to make the order. Now, the actual process involved at the beginning of payment starts with what we call a pro forma invoice. A pro forma invoice. Now, this is like an ordinary invoice, but in fact it's not the real one. It has all the details of the transaction, but it's not yet the real invoice. And that's often given to shipping agents who are doing the transportation. The most important document of payment is the invoice, the invoice or the bill. Now, in the invoice, it's the document that describes the goods, the freight, the merchandise, the quality of that, the quantity, and the price. Also, the terms of payment and the delivery. And the invoice is sent to the buyer with the goods. It accompanies the goods. Then we, as the buyer, have to actually buy the goods, and to do that, payment takes place. Now, the safest way to pay for goods is still the letter of credit. And this is used extensively because it's the safest way. Because why? Because what it is, is and it's an agreement between two banks, the banks of the buyer and the banks of the seller. And when the two banks agree, it's a much safer condition of payment. And as you heard in the video, you heard the words consignor and consignee. Well, the seller is the consigner and the consignee is the buyer. Okay? I hope that gives you some idea of what the whole selling and buying transaction is about and also the main documents that you need in that process. Okay? Great, so see you again in the next lesson. Bye. Welcome back, Gary. How was the International Book Fair in Frankfurt? Great. I cultivated a number of interesting contacts that could lead to great opportunities. I also participated in a very important conference on the current state of affairs in the international book market. Oh, do tell, Gary. Uh, yes, okay, but uh, just a brief summary because I've really got to get going. Mr. Stevens wants a report on the trade fair ASAP, and I've been away for three days, so I've got a ton of work to catch up on. In any case, uh, a number of the top company representatives from the largest international publishing houses participated. The most interesting presentation was surely that of John Schumann, one of the top experts in the publishing sector. And what did he have to say? Excuse me, just a moment. Ah, it's one of my contacts from Frankfurt. <laughs> uh, as I was saying, uh, John Schumann, uh, using the most current data as his starting point, he determined that the publishing market is growing slowly and that the number of readers is stagnant. It's the readers who already buy books and who want to increase the size of their libraries who are responsible for sales. To cut a long story short, the current crisis has been around for a while. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, just the other day, a friend of mine from Amsterdam in the publishing trade was telling me that his company has had to let 15 people go since the beginning of the year. You're kidding. Does that mean that we could become redundant? No, Rachel, uh, I just finished telling you that the trade fair was a huge success. We've just got to look at these things over the long term. It's the latest technologies that will offer the most success in this market. What do you mean? I'm talking about digital editing. We are on the cusp of a revolution in publishing. In other words, the transition from printed publishing to digital publishing. I'm afraid I don't agree with you, Gary. Internet, email, CD-ROM, DVDs, and all electronic gadgets put together will never substitute the joy of reading a book. <laughs> I know, I know, Rachel, you are a Luddite, but this is the future. Uh, the owner of a multimedia publishing house from Stockholm told me that they were able to greatly lower uh, production, distribution, and warehousing costs all due to digital publishing. Not only that, but just think of the level of interaction we can achieve with readers via internet. And besides that, uh, <laughs> just a moment, excuse me. 
I bet it's one of your important contacts from Frankfurt. Yes, as a matter of fact, it is. <laughs> Judging from your expression, I'd say that these contacts are mostly female. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Victoria. Why weren't you at the meeting this morning? Which meeting? The meeting the Mrs. Collins called with all the department heads to come to grips with the situation and I quote, to discuss the means with which we can improve both production and company efficiencies. No one told me anything. I bet she did that on purpose. My darling boss. She wanted to get back at me for a mistake I made on a shipment. She always keeps me out of the loop on all the important developments and makes me do the work of a secretary. I hate her. Come on, Victoria. Chin up. Things will get better. I'm not sure about that, Paul. Anyway, tell me, what did you discuss at the meeting? Well, you can imagine the tone the Mrs. Collins used. She prefers cold and distant. She urged us all to work even harder to overcome this difficult moment for the company. According to her, we should be working 24-7, 365. Listen to this. She told the warehouse manager to calculate the efficiency of workers more precisely as they go about their tasks and, if necessary, to lengthen their hours. Then she invited Mr. Rober, the personal director, to evaluate the necessity of any new hiring. She told him that from now on, each and every short-term or long-term plan must first be evaluated and approved by her. I always said she was a dictator. Yeah. And she claims that we should be delighted at her flexibility and that many corporate heads she knows would just resort with a huge personnel cuts to improve the situation. Oh, what an understanding woman. You bet. Then she added, the companies need to meet deadlines and to work within strict budget in order to keep clients satisfied and remain competitive in the market. Finally, referring to you, she reminded us all that delays and errors in projects are absolutely unacceptable. What are you doing, Victoria? Are you taking notes? No. I'm writing my letter of resignation. Did you hear what she said? She said, I'm writing my letter of resignation. Now, do you remember what that means? Letter of resignation, it means she wants to resign. She wants to leave the company and quit her job. Poor Victoria. Well, let's now turn back to what we said at the beginning of the lesson, which was international affairs. And look at some of the language which is useful for you related to those. Now, if you decide to represent your company in an international fair, you are called an exhibitor. Look at the screen. An exhibitor. And what you have in order to display your things is a stand. It can be small, it can be large, but it's a stand. Also, we use booth. Now, when you go to the fair, the hard work begins because you have to set up or build the stand. Then, when it's ready, you display, which means to show, you display your goods, your products, or your services. Then, at the end of the week, usually it's a week, you take down the stand. Now, if you're on the stand, it's really hard work, and I want to help you with some phrases that can be useful when visitors are walking past. Now, 
As they walk past, you often want to invite them on to the stand. Sometimes they will talk to you directly, but other times they just want to come on and look around. So you could say, um, do come in and have a look around. Have a look around. Now, another thing we use which is very nice is, please feel free to browse. Please feel free to browse. Browse, which is also computer language, it means to look at things calmly. Okay? Now, obviously you don't want to abandon them, so you could say, if you need my help, don't hesitate to ask. If you need my help, don't hesitate to ask me. Okay? Now, obviously, with potential clients, there comes a time where you will be talking about prices. So, um, often a question that they will ask you is what price discount do you offer on large quantities? Price discount, okay? Or what discount do you offer on upfront payment, which is an American term, or cash in advance, which is the British term. So that means you pay upfront. You pay before receiving the goods. Now, when you're answering questions like that, it depends on the person you're talking to because they might be from Japan, from Germany, from America. So an important question to ask is, which currency would you like me to quote you in? Which currency? It could be yen, it could be pounds, it could be uh, French francs, for example. So which currency would you like me to quote you in? Now, you could also say, for example, our price is X works, fob or chief. Now, these might be familiar to you. They are the specific INCO terms. INCO term means the international contract terms. Okay, let's move on. Payment. Now, that's an important consideration. The question could be, what are your terms of payment? And you might answer, want to answer, well, we usually work with a letter of credit. And as we said before in the previous lesson, letter, a letter of credit is probably the safest term of payment. Then delivery questions could be, how long will it take you to deliver after confirmation of the letter of credit? Uh, other, other possibilities are, they will ask you, what are your delivery conditions? Can you shorten your delivery time? Now, shorten means reduce it. So can you shorten your delivery time to, for example, 15 days? And another thing is transportation. Which freight forwarders, do you remember that? Shipping agents, which shipping agents or freight forwarders do you use? Now, if you have to produce things, then you could ask the question, for example, or say, state, we need 60 days production time. Another word for production time is lead time. So we need 60 days production time, lead time from receipt of the letter of credit. That's very important. These conditions are extremely important to state at the beginning of your business relationships. Then, when you've talked and when it's time for the client to leave, you exchange business cards. So you could say, here is my business card with our company details. You can reach me on this number anytime during office hours. Notice we say you can reach me, you can phone me, you can contact me. Then after the fair, you can say, for example, let me know if you need anything or give me a call if you have any queries. Queries, another word for questions. Don't hesitate to contact me if you need help. Okay, and then just wish them have a good trip back because they've probably traveled from another country. All right, well, I hope that helps you in some way to deal with the situation when you're on the stand and good luck because it's really hard work. Okay, thanks very much and see you in the next lesson.
Bye. Paul, don't tell me this is true. Are you really going to leave? Yes, Paul. I just can't stay here. Since Mrs. Collins has arrived, the work climate has become unbearable. She never misses an opportunity to humiliate me and to assign me the most demeaning tasks. And what are you going to do now? Well, I've got in touch with a number of companies. This afternoon, for example, I have an interview with a publishing house. Publishing house? You're not going to become an author, are you? Precisely. You know it's always been a dream of mine. I don't think the interview is going to focus on my literary talents. But, Paul, you look awful. What's the matter? I'm a bit concerned about things. We're having a meeting with the major shareholders of Spectre to take a look at the balance sheets. And is that a problem? Well, as you know, the year-end balance sheets provide an overview of the economical, fiscal and fiduciary effectiveness of our management. And I certainly hope that scrutinizing the books won't uncover inconvenient discrepancies that could lead to a change of a company leadership. What exactly are you referring to? As you know, things haven't been rosy lately even if there has been a slight improvement in share prices during the last quarter. However, at the same time, the outstanding debts to our suppliers have also increased. In other words, our revenues don't cover our expenses. The situation is serious, then. That's right. I'm afraid we'll need to resort to additional outside financing. I've been calculating the various balance sheets entries to understand what's causing our debts and try to develop a plan of attack to get our weak points under control. The results are anything but encouraging. As you well know, the solidity and integrity of our financial core assets are indispensable to keeping our production capabilities intact and revenues flowing I certainly wouldn't want to be in your shoes at the meeting. No kidding. I'm predicting lightning and thunder. I wish I didn't have to participate. Perhaps I could come down with a sudden case of flu or something. How about kidney inflammation accompanied by high fever caused by a highly contagious virus mysteriously present in the company? <laughs> You'll laugh. But now that you won't be here, I'll have to double the work. By the way, they don't happen to need someone else at the publishing house you were speaking about. So you're a secret author as well? Oh, no. But I can do a lot of things. For example, use a computer, make photocopies, send faxes. That should be enough, shouldn't it? What a clown. I'm going to miss your jokes, Paul. Yes. I see. I understand. But it has to be done by Friday. Is that possible? Good. Good. It's very important. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Goodbye. Mrs. Lee, you've got an exceptional CV. Well, thank you, Mr. Stevens. I don't quite understand why you left Spectre. According to this, you are in a position of considerable responsibility. Mm, that's true. I was very satisfied with my job at the beginning. I had a very prestigious position and many high-profile projects were sent my way. However, once Spectre was taken over by a Japanese multinational, things just took a turn to the worse. 
my boss was let go, many of my colleagues were transferred, and I was relieved of my duties. And of course, well, maybe I shouldn't tell you. Please do. No reason to be afraid. Well, the truth is, I just didn't get along with my new boss. I appreciate your frankness. Sincerity is one of the main qualities that I look for in my employees. But tell me, Mrs. Lee, how are your bookkeeping, invoicing, and administrative skills? Mm, excellent, I would say. But I wanted to speak to you about an... Are you familiar with the publishing market? Uh, yes, uh, to a certain degree. But as I was saying, ever since I was a child, I've always been fascinated by... You can tell me about your dreams at another time, Mrs. Lee. Currently, we're busy with our year-end balance sheet, and I need a well-trained assistant to prepare an assessment of our administrative expenses and to study our assets and liabilities. You, considering your experiences, appear to be a perfect fit. Well, thank you, Mr. Stevens. But once this emergency has blown over, I was wondering if perhaps you could take me into consideration as a... As a yes? As an author. I'm quite talented. My literature professor at university used to encourage me. This is not a school, Mrs. Lee. I got in touch with you to speak to you about our marketing office. That's what I'd like to hire you for. Please don't be offended, but keep your dreams to yourself for the moment. As far as books are concerned, we can get started on the bookkeeping immediately. Certainly, but later? We'll see, we'll see. Did you notice how Mr. Stevens was reading a CV, it was Victoria's curriculum vitae, when he was doing the interview with her? Well, often, in reality, people doing interviews don't have time to read the whole CV. And so, if you're in the interview, you have to look at the information very quickly and just get the general understanding of it. So what he was doing, he was skimming for important information. And that's what I want to talk to you about now, are the four skills that we use for reading, which are skimming, scanning, extensive reading, and intensive reading. So let's call on the screen to look at those. Now, the first thing that I talked about was skimming, which is what I said Mr. Stevens was doing. And that means that you read quickly in order to get the most important information or to get the gist. The gist is the general understanding. The most important information to get the gist. And this is what you will do in your job, for example, if you're, you have to use uh, read a newspaper quickly, magazines, business and travel brochures, for example. So you read them quickly to pick out the important information. That's skimming. The second one is scanning. Now, we use scanning in order to extract particular information, a particular piece of information. So, for example, if you want to see a particular television program, you scan it. If you want to think about travel, if you want to see what train or what plane leaves a train or a plane schedule, you scan it and pick out the particular information important for you. Also, a conference guide. When there are many speeches, you scan and pick out the one relevant to you. So that's skimming, scanning. What about uh, extensive reading? Now, extensive reading is the type of reading you use when you want to obtain a general understanding about a subject. So, for example, it could mean for you reading a market strategy book or a novel or a magazine article which is related to your job. So, extensive reading for general understanding. And the last one is the intensive reading, and that is for very close 
very accurate reading for detail and that's where you read for every word it's important to understand every word and every fact obviously and in this case you would use it with like a bookkeeping report very important to look at the details an insurance claim or for contracts terribly important to read every word that is intensive reading so remember that when you, you're in your workplace, it's important to be able to move between skimming, scanning, extensive reading and intensive reading. Sometimes in English, you are tempted to want to understand every word. So you use a dictionary. It takes ages. It's just not necessary. Remember, check on what the task is that you want to achieve and then choose whether you need to skim or scan and don't bother about the words that you don't understand. Go for the particular information. All right? So happy reading. Bye and see you in the next lesson. Excuse me, my name's Victoria Lee. Today's my first day at work and I'd like to know... Great. Great way to start. Where is everybody? Mr. Stevens told me I was going to meet my new colleagues and they were going to explain everything. Wonder if I've come to the wrong department. Ah, you must be the new arrival. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Rachel. The pleasure's all mine. My name's Victoria Lee. Mr. Stevens asked me to show you the office and explain everything. So. Over there is the fax and the photocopier. This is your desk and computer. Um, what else? Oh, yes, you'll find a coffee machine down the hall. But please remember. A few breaks and please keep them short. <laughs> this gentleman is Gary Reynolds, head of marketing. How do you do? I'm Victoria. Mr. Stevens tells me that we're going to be working closely together. I must say it's quite a pleasure to spend so much time with such a lovely young lady. Happily married woman, married with a son, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well done, Victoria. Let him know who's who. Gary's the kind of guy who can't control himself with attractive women. <clears throat> Thank you for the compliment, Rachel. Let's get down to work. Here's an analysis of last year's investments. As you can see, we've consistently improved our bottom line in all sectors even if, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we need to move more aggressively into the market. What exactly do you mean? Well, uh, improve our e-commerce play, for example. Um, let's imagine for a moment that Pilgrim were to develop an advanced uh, online catalog that would allow users to purchase directly online. Don't you think that this way we could dramatically cut our distribution costs? Certainly, but what does Mr. Stevens think? Well, he's a bit old school in his way of thinking. Uh, according to his worldview, we should focus on sales through more traditional channels. I, on the other hand, would be thrilled if you saw things more along my lines. Uh, why don't we develop a realistic marketing strategy that includes possible e-commerce earnings? Uh, perhaps we could convince him together. I'm afraid I can't at the moment, Gary. I've got to focus on the bookkeeping to begin with. Listen, uh, why don't we have a little dinner together tonight and then continue working at my house? I'm married, remember, Gary? <laughs> Statistics, accounts, reports, not much has changed from Spectre. And I was hoping for a more creative position. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> oh, hello. You must be the new hire. I'm Ann Baxter. I'm Victoria Lee. <clears throat> I recognise your name. Have we met before? I don't think so. Or perhaps we met at the Red Lion pub. I often go there with my friends. No, it doesn't sound familiar. Actually, I have a son, so I don't get out much. But still, I've heard your name before. Just a moment, now I remember. We met on the telephone when I was still working at Spectre. We both had that problem with our courier, fast. Oh, yes. 
Oh, yes, I remember now. You were having problems with a shipment to, to China. Gosh, <laughs> what a coincidence. Well, who would have ever thought we would end up working together? So, how are things going? Well, it's still too early to say. Today's my first day at work. Oh. Well, I presume you've already met Gary. Yes, earlier. We're working on a project together. And I bet he's already invited you out to dinner. Yes, as a matter of fact. And he's probably told you that he loves working with charming young girls such as yourself. Yes, and how do you know? <laughs> he always uses the same line. He did the same with me. How original. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pleased that you've joined us here and well, I hope we'll become great friends. <laughs> Yes, well, I'm sure we will. You're very nice. <laughs> and who knows, maybe that telephone call was destiny. <laughs> so let's talk about making presentations. I think it's very important when you decide to make a presentation to give it a good structure because that will help you when you're actually giving it. So let's look at some of the language which will help you give the presentation structure, okay? And let's call on the screen to help us with that. Um, first, it's important to draw everybody's attention to make sure people are quiet. So you could say, for example, shall we start? Shall we begin? Or let's get started. All right, now those are ways to draw the attention of the audience. Then you need to greet them. So you could say, for example, good morning, everyone, which is quite informal. Good morning, everyone. More formal would be good morning, ladies and gentlemen. That's more formal. So you greet them. Then you introduce yourself. So it would be like this. An example would be, uh, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Let me introduce myself. My name is Louise Evans and I'm in charge of marketing. Okay, so you give your name and also your position of responsibility in the company. So you can say, I'm in charge of or I'm responsible for marketing. Then you need to introduce the topic of your presentation. So you could say, the aim or the purpose, watch the pronunciation, the aim or the purpose or the objective of my presentation today is to talk about the marketing strategy. So three words, aim, objective or purpose. Good. You could also say, for example, I'd like to give you a brief overview or an outline. Now that's quite similar to summary. It means a general picture. So I'd like to give you an overview or an outline of our marketing strategy. Then you need to uh, usually divide the presentation up into three or four or five points. So we could say uh, I'll divide my presentation up into four, notice we say I'll divide my presentation up into, it's quite complicated that, I'll divide my presentation up into four points. Now another word for points is items or we could say headings, areas, sections or subjects. Please don't say arguments because an argument means a heated conversation between two people. So I'll divide my presentation up into four main points, items, headings, areas, sections or subjects. Then you need to look at the verbs that you can use because you can say then firstly I'd like to discuss the marketing strategy, I'd like to introduce the marketing strategy. I'd like to look at, look at is the same as analyze or consider. I'd like to explain, that means talk about the details so that people understand. I'd like to examine, I'd like to show, and I'd like to illustrate. These are the main verbs that you would use uh, when describing what you're going to do. 
So firstly, you can say firstly, secondly, and finally, or um, last of all. So you see you divide it up into sections. Firstly, secondly, finally, last of all. Now, it's often a good idea to talk about the duration, uh, the length of your presentation, because often business presentations can be too long and boring. And if you say, for example, my presentation shouldn't take longer than 30 minutes, people are psychologically prepared and feel happier, that they're not going to have to sit through a whole load of slides and a long, long explanation. Give them a time reference. Then, uh, you need to decide when you're giving your presentation if you want people to interrupt you during it or if they should ask questions at the end of your presentation. Now, if you want to invite participation during the presentation, you could say, for example, please feel free to interrupt if anything's not clear. Okay? Please feel free to interrupt if anything's not clear, if you want to ask questions. Now, sometimes in a shorter presentation, you would prefer to take questions at the end of the presentation. So you could say something like this. If you have any questions, um, could, you, could I ask you to keep them until the end of the presentation? Let's look at that again. It's not easy. If you have any questions, could I ask you to keep them until the end of the presentation when I'll be very happy to answer them, all right? So there you keep control of how much interruption you have in your presentation. So we've said, firstly, I'd like to discuss or I'd like to talk about the marketing strategy. Now, when you want to move on to the second point, you can say in English, good. Now let's move on to my next point, move on to my next point. Another possibility is, good, that brings me to my next point. So that's moving the presentation forward. If somebody interrupts you and you don't want to handle the interruption at that moment, you can say, yes, that's a very good question, but can I come back to that later? So recognize the question and say, that's a good question to show that you're going to deal with it, but then say, can I come back to that later? And of course, if you say that, make sure you remember that question, make a mental note and always answer it. Then to conclude the presentation, you can say, I'd like to finish by saying that, or I'd like to conclude by saying that, or you can say, in conclusion, I think we should, in conclusion. And the very last things to say are usually, um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for it. your attention is not necessary because you're doing the work, they're there to listen to you. So it's just better, I think, to say, that's it, that's it, which means it's finished. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming, or thank you very much. All right? So, I hope that helps you with your future presentations. Remember, structure is very important, and it will help you remember things more clearly. So, good luck with any presentation that you do in the future, and good luck in general with your business English. Bye. Hello, and here we are for the last Business Talk program. Hi there. Today we'll look again at win-win language, but this time we'll concentrate on the language of negotiation and small talk. We saw last time that those three fundamental points, organization, simplicity, and appropriate language, are very important in any context. But let's have a look now at how win-win language can produce positive results in a negotiation. Eric and I are going to act out an example of a supplier asking for a price increase to cover transport costs. As you listen, keep in mind team spirit and a positive approach.
Listen, James, I'm afraid we're going to have to increase the cost of our deliveries to you. We can't go on delivering at the price we agreed last year. The cost of fuel is too high at the moment. Uh, I'm sorry, Carol, but I can't accept any changes to our agreement at the moment. But, James, we're losing money on every delivery we make. We have to do something. I think my company would prefer to look for another supplier in that case. I'm really not prepared to change what we agree. I'm sure other supplies will be just as expensive, and you know we've always met our deadlines. No. Either you keep to your agreement, or I'm going to look for another supplier. Now, this was a typical I win, you lose situation. Okay, now let's have a look at a possible outcome if win-win language had been applied. Listen, James, I'm afraid we're going to have to increase the cost of our deliveries to you. We can't go on delivering at the prices we agreed last year. The cost of fuel is too high at the moment. Carol, this is very difficult. Uh, let's try to see if we can find an alternative solution. A <laughs> Good idea. Why don't we try to break down your costs and see if we can help you make some savings? Well, as I said, the problem is simple. It's the high cost of fuel. Uh, how about trying to reduce the number of trips? If we can order in bigger quantities, surely you can save on the fuel. It might be possible. Give me some time to make some calculations. Okay. Shall we talk tomorrow and see if we can reach an agreement that works for both of us? The result in this situation is very different. Eric was friendlier in his approach and didn't immediately turn down my request. First, he tried to find out exactly what I wanted. Yes, the idea is to look for alternative solutions that make both parties happy. Let's have a look now at how the same language I used in the negotiation can also work in a more informal situation like a business lunch. This time, we're deciding where to go for dinner this evening. A clear I win, you lose situation would be... What would you like to do this evening? I'd like to go to a fish restaurant. Hmm. Unfortunately, my wife doesn't like fish. Well, I'm sure the restaurant will serve something else for her. Well, yes, all right. I know a good fish restaurant. Could you pick me up at the hotel? Hmm. Yeah, sure. This time, I'll apply some win-win language. Let's see what happens. What would you like to do this evening? How about going to a fish restaurant? Does your wife like fish? Mm, unfortunately, she doesn't. Mm, no problem. Why don't we try to find a restaurant that your wife likes that can offer me some good fish as well? Great idea. I think you'll like her favorite restaurant. They do fish, too. Fine. Let's meet at the restaurant. I can take a taxi from the hotel. Oh, of course not. We'll pick you up at the hotel. OK, well, we haven't got time for anything else today, so goodbye. Bye-bye. So, if you're negotiating or deciding where to go for an informal business dinner, win-win language can really make a difference. Let's have a look at the four phrases used in both win-win situations that made this difference. How about? How about trying to reduce the number of trips? Why don't we? Why don't we try to find a restaurant that your wife likes? Let's. Let's try to see if we can find an alternative solution. Shall we? What time shall we meet? When placed at the beginning of a sentence, these phrases involve the other person and keep them involved in the conversation. Even in informal situations, it's important that no one comes away feeling they've lost. So this technique can be very useful. The key to small talk is simplicity. Use open questions. Where did you go on holiday last year? They keep the conversation going. Try not to use closed questions. Did you go on holiday last year? They only require a yes or no answer, which can often finish a conversation. Prepare some simple responses to things that people may tell you. That's interesting. Congratulations. Oh, how terrible. That's too bad. Fantastic. Amazing. Most important, prepare an appropriate way to say goodbye. I think it's time for me to get back to the hotel. Thank you for a lovely evening. I'm afraid I have to be leaving soon. I still have to finish some work. It's been wonderful meeting all of you. 
Well, it's been really nice talking to you. Use win-win language and everyone...